Thank you all. This meeting is being recorded, and that reminds me that um, last week's meeting was also recorded, and the video is now on YouTube in case you missed it and want to see it. Um, so as you recall, last week's talk was by uh, Pasquale Cirillo, who teaches in our uh, boot camp. And today, by synchronicity, we have uh, Conal O'Sullivan, who also teaches in our boot camp. Um, so I uh, will read you his bio, and then he'll get started. So um, Conal graduated with a double major in math and physics from University College Dublin, and subsequently attained a PhD in finance from the University College Dublin Michael Smurfit Graduate Business School. After a spell in the asset management industry working in quantitative strategy, Conal became assistant professor in finance at the Michael Smurfit Graduate Business School. His primary research interests are in derivatives and fixed income markets. Recent research has been published in the Journal of Banking and Finance, Quantitative Finance, International Journal of Theoretical and Applied Finance, and the Journal of Computational Finance. So as I mentioned, Kona was a visiting scholar at NYU's Finance and Risk Engineering Department in 2019 and is an instructor in our MSc in Financial Engineering Bootcamp. So um, we're actually a pretty small group. So um, I'm actually, if it's okay with Conal, I think we could handle um, questions um, sort of at any point. Um, and just you, so if you feel you have something urgent, just unmute and ask, it'll be fine with me. Okay, we'll see how that goes for a while. <clears throat> okay. All right, so Conal, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Peter, for the introduction and for the invite today. Um, I can share my screen then to the group, can I? Uh, yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> so hang on. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, give it a shot. Okay. So yeah, it looks like I can share my screen. Um, okay, so my talk today then is gonna be an option employed quantiles and market returns. Um, so this is joint work with Yan Wang. Um, Yan has just finished a postdoc at the Smurfit Business School and uh, he's on the job market. So if any of you you have anything, please let me know. Um, and what we do is um, we uh, show that the risk neutral quantile is a solution uh, to a minimization problem that's independent of the data generating process of the underlying asset. And then we extract those risk neutral quantiles from the S&P 500 index using uh, it's over 20 years of data. And then we look at the difference between the negative left and the right tail return quantiles. So we look at the 5% left quantile and the 95% right quantile. And we look at the negative left minus the right. And we show that that's actually quite significant in forecasting market returns at horizons of two years or more. And we provide a theoretical justification for that using a, a consumption-based asset pricing model with a stochastic disaster risk. So that's kind of just a rundown of, of the talk. Um, so the quantile estimator we propose, it's based on an objective function that's used in quantile regression. And um, so Coenker has a very nice monograph on quantile regression. And uh, what it does is it, it turns the problem of risk neutral quantile estimation into a convex optimization problem. And no assumption is made regarding the underlying process. So it can be, um, so it belongs to the, the class of model free estimators of which um, uh, Peter, of course, is one of the pioneers. Here are some of the references. Um, and of course, the rigorous equivalence of model free measures hinges on the ability to have a, a continuum of strikes that, that cover all futures prices or spot prices. Um, so we have to deal with that. Um, so these model free measures are usually accompanied by smoothing of implied volatilities. Um, and uh, the robustness of these measures is yet to be really fully understood in, in, in finite samples. For instance, Dennis and Mayhew, they do a simulation that's cited a lot in subsequent studies. But in their simulation, um, so they look at the robustness of these measures to uh, uh, a truncated strike range and to discreteness in strikes. But their simulation is based on a geometric Fermi motion, which, is, which has symmetric returns. Um, and so they find if you go too 
the standard deviations either side of the forward price, you should be fine. But again, that it depends on using geometric Brownian motion. And, and that paper is cited a lot subsequently. And people tend to use those two standard deviations as, as, as a benchmark uh, as to far out how you should go on the strike range. Um, so the model-free quantile proposing this work then, it's essentially an order statistic with the risk-neutral distribution in a finite sample. Um, so we can interpret then the risk-neutral quantile as the coverage of an insurance contract that, that, that pays off a dollar in the event of the exceedance occurring. And the future price of the, free, of the premium paid is equal to its probability level. So if you can imagine the risk neutral 5% left quantile might perhaps be minus 15%. So what we're saying is um, that over the next month, let's say we're looking at horizons of one month, over the next month that the risk neutral probability that the, uh, the market will drop less than uh, by more than 15% is 5%, okay? So it, it's like an exceedance level. And obviously that risk neutral quantile on the left tail is gonna be larger than the physical quantile. Um, and sometimes if we're focusing on the left tail and uh, on the more extreme quantiles, um, it's often referred to as economic value at risk. This is a term used by Itahalia and Lowe. And um, we can also think of it as a recent quantile as uh, a spectral value at risk where the return outcomes are weighted by a utility function. So we're going to use the symmetric return quantile differences of a given probability level. We can tune the probability level. So for instance, we can look at the minus 5% left tail minus the 95% right tail. And we show that this forecast market returns and it's actually particularly strong at 10% 15 and 20 percent so we when we come in a little bit from the more extreme tails we don't go beyond five percent and we also run bivariate regressions uh, that control forever well-known predictors such as the variance risk premium that again um, uh, peter was wrote one of the pioneering pe uh, papers on so this is a proposition then so um the tout quantile of a risk neutral distribution is the solution to the following minimization problem. So here we have a convex combination of puts and calls across strike prices at a given horizon or a given maturity level. And if you can imagine this plots a convex function and what we want to do is minimize this convex function with respect to the strike price. So this um, funny shape K here that is denoting the space of strike strike prices. So if we minimize this, then we're going to get the risk neutral quantile at, for the tout quantile. So this is the proof. Uh, it's very short. Um, so this is the objective function, just writing it out. In uh, So here we have puts and here we have calls and we have this convex combination of them. And a QS is the risk neutral distribution function of the option asset price. And the objective function is convex from the no arbitrage condition. And if we take the first order condition, we have uh, zero. So we take the first order condition with respect to the strike K. We have zero equals one minus tau, the integral from zero to K of DQS minus tau, the integral from K to infinity of DQS. And then if we add these up, we see that's just equal to the quantile at K minus tau. So this tells us this quantile evaluated at this particular strike price is equal to tau. Okay, so that's, that's the proof. And Peter, uh, when I ran this formula by uh, past Peter a couple of months back, he's, he said it was an example of a of convex duality. And so Peter had used the objective function before himself in, in some work. Is that right, uh, Peter? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not surprised uh, that he's used it before. But anyway, this is maybe a slightly different way of looking at it. Yeah, I thought of the objective function is a way to combine puts and calls uh, together to each give a signal um, <clears throat> about what I called optionality. <laughs> okay, anyway. Okay, so this is just an example of this objective function under the Black Scholes model. And uh, so tau is 5% here. So we're looking at the, what you might call the 95% value at risk. 
assuming zero drift. Um, so here we have the Black-Scholes model here. Um, so this is the objective function, which is the convex combination of puts and calls, where tau is, is 0 0.05. And 70 or just above 70 is the strike price that minimizes this objective function. And we see then this would be the value at risk, this the 70 value. So dropping from 100 down to 70. And if you, can, if you converted that into a return, we take the log of 70 minus the log of 100, and that would give us um, what we call, instead of a QVAR, we call that a QRAR for return at risk. Um, so the model free quantile formula, it allows flexibility in setting these probability levels because we can just tune the probability levels. Um, so this generality, it's distinct from existing tail estimators that we tend to rely on extreme value theory or numerical integration schemes where you might get the, um, you might try to extract the full risk neutral density function. And then um, you might want to integrate the tail and for extreme strikes, you might want to just assume that the implied volatility is flat or follows some sort of uh, asymptotic formula. Um, so so um, like, to say, well, your math is certainly correct. I mean, um, like, and, it, and I, you know, I understand, like me, you're presupposing the ability to observe puts and calls at all strikes, which is a standard thing to do. And um, so I'm just thinking that if you can observe puts and calls at all strikes, then sort of, obviously, you can observe the um, CDF at every strike. And, um, and then why can't one just invert that function to get the quantile? Like, so is there an advantage of seeing it through an optimization lens? Um. And I guess it's just a different way of looking at it. You are correct. You can just use the CDF from the continuum of puts and calls and just extract it in that manner. Yeah, and it's just the quantile is just the inverse of that function. Yes. Yeah. I haven't. So, yeah. So it, it is know, equivalent. Yeah. I just think it's maybe slightly more elegant. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> like, and so it's definitely more elegant what you're doing. Um, and so, and I'm just wondering what it buys us. I mean, it probably does buy us something, but it's worth thinking about. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I have a practical question. Sure. Since you're looking at tails. You're going to have large numbers of strikes where the bid offer spread will be something like no bid at a dime or no bid or five cents at you know a dime and um it's it's sort of meaningless right these are just a stray bid that showed up um so it's hard to know which uh theoretical value you should use so we follow the procedure for um, bidding for um, for the VIX. So I talk about that in a few slides, and this filters the extreme options. Um, so, for instance, we get rid of any options with a, a zero bid price, and we throw away any options with a bid price less than fifty less than fifty cents. I think it is. Um, so I will discuss that in, in a few slides, actually, in, in quite a bit of detail. OK. So um, we also think that, that this could be used to define corridors in, in a corridor variance contract, for instance. Um, so in a corridor variance swap contract, um, you might want to set the corridors according to the probability mass. This might be a nice way to do it. Yep. So um, if we focus on the left, left tail risk neutral quantile, which is often what, what people do in the literature, um, our quantiles are also related to the previous works that have used scale bear spreads to approximate basically an hour degree of security that pays off a dollar in the event of passing the most extreme strike, which in this case is K2. So in a scale bear, uh, in this scale bear spread, we could then solve for the strikes so that um, 
the forward price of the scale bear spread is equal to the equal to the probability level, which might be say five percent. So that's just another way to do it as well. And so Karen, we will use this um, uh, before um, on single stocks and related these scale bear spreads at the CDS contracts. Uh, Lou and Murray have looked at the returns of these scale bear spreads and have shown that it's, um, it's priced in the cross section of stocks, this particular risk factor. So that's just another way of looking at it. Okay, so the data then, I'll, I'll quickly run through this. It's option metrics. It covers most of the sample, January 96 to June 2019. We replicate the VIX methodology in our sample selection. We use 30 day constant maturity quantiles. Um, we use, so before October 6, 2014, we use a near term and an X term which straddled the 30 day maturity. And then from, and then after that, we have weeklies which straddle the 30 day maturity a bit closer. So we tend to use them then afterwards. Um, um, a couple of other things to mention then. So we eliminate any zero bid quotes, uh, excluding any further EBITDA money options once two, bid, once two zero bid quotes are observed, which is the VIX method. And, um, and at the money, option is defined by its strike price that equals the forward price. Okay, and we follow uh, Steve Pigluski. We augment the strike price then by a cortex spline. It smoothly passes through the implied vols, uh, the bid ask spreads. Um, so, we, so we get the implied vols at the mids and at the bids and at the asks. And this probably answers Mike's question. We discard very deep end money options by ensuring minimum bid price of 50 cent. And we can we combine put and call samples by, by only using out of the money options and at the money options. And for at the money options, we go 20, uh, we use 20 index points either side to combine both calls and puts. This is quite standard. And so the bid ask and uh, midpoint quotes, they're converted into IVs. And this is how we blend the at the money options. So we blend, we take a weighted average of puts and calls in this region. So this is all quite standard. And then we fit this cortex line with a single break, as I mentioned, at the forward price. We fit it to midpoint IVs and we use weighted least squares that, that will penalize heavily um, when the IV is outside the bid ask spread and otherwise doesn't penalize so much. So this is a picture of it here. So uh, I hope you can see that. Um, Maybe I can just focus in a little bit here. So we see um, the greens here are the IV asks and the reds are the IV bids and the black dots are the bid points and the blue is the smoothed IV curve. Um, that's the IV smile on a particular day. Uh, the middle plot is... Sorry, what's the underlying here? So the underlying... The S&P 500. Okay. Yes, and that's, uh, it's on the 17th of November, 2017. Um, so we're actually looking at a 27 day IV here. Okay. And then in the middle plot, we have call and put prices. And so the greens are puts, the brown dots are calls. The size of the dots are related to the open interest. Hmm. Two dashed, Vertical lines are 20 points either side of the forward price. The forward price here is the pink star here. And then over here on the right, then we have this objective function, which is the, the black curve here, which is the convex combination of puts and calls. And this is our Q var at 5%. So here's our Q var here. Um, okay. And these are the 5% uh, Q bar and 95% Q bar estimated extracted daily over the full sample. So if you can imagine then uh, the predictor we're going to use then is we take uh, the blue 
curve here, or the blue uh, graph, and we reflect it through the x-axis, and then we subtract from the blue curve the red curve. Okay, yeah. so that so that's the idea. We're trying to sort of get rid of volatility effects and focus more on left tail effects. Okay, so so the difference between the negative uh, left quantile and the right quantile then reflects both the asymmetry in the physical distribution and it reflects risk aversion as well. Okay, and um, so there's a growing body of research that uses tail risk to predict market returns. So we're just going to focus a little bit then on disaster risk consumption based asset pricing models that will potentially explain why our Q tail measure can predict P market returns. So um, just a quick whistle stop tour, I won't spend too long here uh, of consumption based CAPM models, but you probably heard of the equity risk premium puzzle that um, the equity risk premium is far too high relative to the volatility of consumption growth, assuming reasonable levels of risk aversion. So in these models, in these simple models where consumption follows a diffusion process, the equity risk premium is going to be equal to the leverage times risk aversion times the variance of consumption. The variance of consumption is just, just far too low uh, given the historical average of the equity risk premium. So um, there have been then models put forward that allow for a disaster state. And then this disaster state in consumption where consumption might drop by say more than 10%, this can then increase the equity risk premium and these models then have been augmented with stochastic disaster risk uh, consumption cap M models. And the, so the constant uh, disaster risk models, they, they can pick up the fact that the equity risk premium is much higher, is much closer to what is observed, but they don't pick up other empirical stylized facts like excess stock market volatility or the fact that the price dividend ratio can predict the equity risk premium. So, there's newer models that allow for stochastic disaster risk. And um, these models, they generate high equity risk premium, excess stock market volatility, and they generate a link between the price dividend ratio and the predictability of the ERP. And um, one of the main ones we're gonna focus on is Watchster's model. And say on Watchster, they priced options in this model and they priced them using the Fourier transform approach, but the characteristic function has to be solved numerically, but it can be solved using run uh, a set of run uh, or the differential equation solvers. Um, so what we're gonna show is that in this model, basically the uh, stochastic disaster risk, that impacts this uh, tail difference or this quantile difference very significantly, especially at the extreme levels of probability. And this stochastic disaster is also impacts the, the equity risk premium. So that's our channel then that this latent uh, stochastic disaster is probability. Uh, it's uh, intensity, uh, a jump intensity where the jump is a disaster in consumption. Uh, well, that's latent. And but it impacts an observable, which is this risk neutral quantile difference. So then we can make the link between this risk neutral quantile difference and the equity risk premium. So that's the idea. Um, so just a quick run through this model, I won't spend too much time. Uh, so we have standard jump diffusion model, but we can think of the Z here as a drop in consumption. So this will be a large drop in consumption. And um, the intensity or uh, loosely speaking, the probability of disaster follows a CIR type process. Okay, and as I said, then uh, ZT can be thought of as a disaster in consumption. Uh, so a disaster now is a drop of say 10% or 15%. And then uh, dividends are leveraged consumption. So there's consumption raised to the power of phi. And then uh, Watchster uses an S times N type recursive utility function. It's actually important to use that utility function because that generates 
the right relationship between the dividend price ratio and uh, the equity risk premium. That the dividend price ratio is a predictor of the equity risk premium. If you use uh, just a power utility function, you get the wrong relationship. You get that, that when the dividend price ratio is high, the equity risk premium is low. So you need to use this recursive utility function here. And then the market price then is just, well, uh, risk neutral expectation of the sum of discounted dividends, or we can write it physical expectation, of the sum of the pricing kernel times uh, the future dividends. And the price dividend ratio then is given by this formula here, and it's, uh, it's closed form up to an integration. And you see it depends on lambda t. So we use the model then um, to derive the risk neutral stochastic process for the stock price. And um, it involves an approximation, which is a log linear approximation that's used in sale and watch of the first derivative of the dividend price ratio. Um, and so with that model then, we can solve for the characteristic function numerically using run coda ODE solvers. This is the approach used in uh, Duffy Pan and Singleton. And then we use a fractional FFT to invert the, uh, the characteristic function to get a PDF. And then we calculate quantiles from this PDF in the Watchster model. And we're going to use the set of parameters from the Watchster model that are calibrated to an international database of consumption declines because if you just focus on US data, you just don't have enough consumption declines to get reliable set of parameters. Yeah, this is, I just have a clarifying question. So sure. at the beginning of your talk, you, you correctly said this is all model free and now you're presenting a model due to Wachter. Um, so what's the motivation for having a model? Okay, so the model basically is just to give us some motivation for the empirical results which are gonna come up. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're saying that in this model that um, this stochastic disaster risk right, which is really lambda here, right? This is in the physical measure, right? Okay. We're going to show that this stochastic disaster risk has a big effect on the risk neutral quantiles, in particular on the difference between say the 5% and the 95%. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, at the same time, in the Washer model, this stochastic disaster risk lambda t here, this has a positive effect on the risk premium, right? When that goes up, the risk premium goes up. So this is our connection here. Let me just, it's kind of from this model, right? We have lambda t is, is unobservable, right? It's a latent process, very hard to estimate. This is the stochastic intensity of, of the disaster in consumption. This is unobservable, right? And I've shown the previous couple of slides that I just skipped, but I got, I'll, I'll come back to them. That this impacts the tail difference, say 5%, which is a Q observable. Okay. Yeah. And then in the Watchman model, this general equilibrium model, we have that lambda T also has a large impact on the equity risk premium. And it's a time varying impact as well. Okay. Okay. We're making, so then we're going to ask, is this the case with the data? So we can't observe the stochastic uh, jump intensity, but we can observe the tail difference that we extract right. from the options markets. Okay. And then we can ask then, does this impact on the equity risk premium? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. So I guess the interest in the, Walker model is that this is a previous model that predicted that um, there would be a relationship between tail difference and equity risk premium, right? Yeah, well, they didn't predict the particular tail difference. They just focused on the implications of the model. So Watcher just focused on the implications of the model with respect to the unobservable lambda t. So Watcher calibrated the model to um, it was international consumption data, and then they just looked at like the uh, the average ERP and comparative statics, things like that. So we're the ones making the link to this risk neutral tail difference. Okay. Okay. 
uh, but we're just using the washer model to motivate that, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, is it a model that you kind of feel is realistic? Is that the reason it's being used here? Or, uh... Well, it, I, I guess it's like, it's obviously oversimplified, but it's, you know, it's a general equilibrium model that it doesn't fit any, any prices in the market. It just takes a set of parameters um, from uh, looking at international consumption data. Okay, and with those set of parameters reproduces a lot of stylized empirical facts that we observe in the stock market. Okay. Right? Okay. So like the high expected, the high equity risk premium, the fact that the dividend price ratio is a predictor of the ex equity risk premium, the fact that you have excess stock market volatility relative to dividends, those types of stylized empirical facts. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I'm not saying, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a type of model you use for derivatives pricing. It's, it's a type of model that one, one can reproduce a lot of stylized empirical facts with this model, but obviously it's oversimplified. Okay. Right? Um, so unfortunately in the watching model, the, the quantiles are not closed form. We have to solve for them numerically as I've just, just, just been saying a few minutes ago. So these are the quantiles here we've, times 12, we've annualized them and multiplied by 100. So here, this is a function of lambda t here. So lambda t is on the, hor on the horizontal axis. That's the jump intensity, uh, the intensity of the disaster. And it's actual quantiles on the vertical axis. And the lowermost plot here is the 5% quantile. And the uppermost plot is the 95% quantile. Okay, so we can see that the difference between them is quite sensitive to uh, jump intensity. Okay, and this is the, the difference between them. So at 5%, I'm talking about the difference between the 5% and 95%, specifically the negative 5% minus the 95%. At 10%, I'm talking about the 10% and 90% and so on. Mm -hmm. So again, we see that the tail difference is quite sensitive to this uh, jump intensity lambda. Um, and so the reason I use the range of jump intensities from zero uh, to 30% is because in the washer model, you get a stationary just a distribution for lambda, which is gamma, and using the parameters from the watcher model, which are just calibrated to that in international consumption data, this is the distribution for lambda. So lambda tends to lie between just above zero up to just under 30%. So that's why I just looked at that range. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. So this is, I hope, a kind of a, a reasonable motivation for why we are then using this tail difference as a predictor of the equity risk premium. And um, the X here then can be tuned. So we can change from 5% to 10% to 15% easily enough. Um, so there are the predictive regressions we're going to run. Okay, here's are some sim summary stats here. Um, so the equity risk premium, 6.42%, oh. the mean, and this is standard deviation here. And just I'll just focus on the tail difference here. This is at 5%. So the mean of the tail difference is quite high here because it's been annualized. Uh, so it's 44.34, and this is its standard deviation. And then we have other predictors that have been examined by um, Goyle and Welch. And the very last two are the left jump variation of uh, the left, hump, left jump tail variation from uh, Boleslav, Todorov, and Zhu, where they actually focus on the uh, jump component of the variance risk premium. And the very last one is the variance risk premium itself. So, just a quick comment about the linear sure. regression on the previous slide. Sure. Um, so while theoretically, let's say S&P 500 equity risk premium could be negative, we've never actually experienced that. And likewise, while theoretically the tail difference could be negative, I bet you never experienced that. And so, um, you know, your dependent variable and your independent variable are both like non-negative in practice. And um, so it suggests taking logs of them and then doing linear regression. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a nice suggestion. Yeah. 
<coughs> that might improve results. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just mention, so this is a correlation table again, uh, let me just focus in here a little bit. Um, I'll just focus on a couple of points because it, it's too large to discuss, but the correlation of the tail difference with the dividend price ratio is 35%. Um, notice the correlation with the left jump uh, tail variation here. It would have, so this is a LJV here, that's 74%. Um, so this is a kind of a measure of the risk neutral tail of the variance, okay? Um, and the VRP here has a very low correlation with, with the VRP. It's, it's correlation with the equity risk premium with the contemporaneous equity risk premium is actually negative, minus 31%, because this difference is obviously very high when the market is um, going down. Okay, so these are the predictive regressions. So I have the constant here, and then I have the tail difference here, and we have three different types of standard errors. And um, one of them, we couldn't invert the matrix, so it's a blank here. What we see when we hit about 24 months with the equity risk premium, that uh, we begin to get quite high significance. Okay, so the tail difference coefficient is 0.15, and the T stats are quite significant. Um, it's not significant up to that point, but remains significant after that point. And if we're to use Newey West, which one should really use if there is a relationship between the predictor and the equity risk premium, the Newey West uh, T stats are the ones in curly brackets. So they would be our, our, our strongest result here. Um, so here we actually tune the, um, at the probability level. So here, instead of just looking at the tail difference of 5%, we could, for instance, look at the tail difference of 10% and 15 and 20%. Um, we actually find that the predictor gets stronger. Here we're actually using Hodrick's standard errors, so they're a bit uh, more uh, higher threshold than the US standard errors. But um, the significance gets actually stronger at 10% and at 15% and then begins to drop again. And I'll show, you, I'll, I'll show later, one of the reasons is because uh, the tail difference of 5% it has a higher standard deviation than the tail difference of 10%. And that could be one of the reasons why you get higher significance here at 10%. Just to mention, if you yeah. use risk neutral I mean, units, you will not get these, uh, these results here. So if one was to just replace this with model free skewness, for instance, you don't replicate this significance. And another point to mention is that these uh, left tail measures um, in the literature, they have only found to have predictive power at long horizons. They never have predictive power at short horizons, mm. okay? So this is standard in the literature, like Kelly and John look at a physical left, left tail measure. And then there's a Anderson and Todorov and company like Fusari and Zoo and so on. They look at a risk neutral left tail risk measure. Um, and it tends to kick in at longer horizons. Do you want to say something, Peter? Or did... No, it's just surprising. That's all. I mean, okay. so you're, you're using like your tail difference is based on 30 day horizon and, and yeah. yet it's predicting um, equity risk premium at horizons of like two years, let's say, <clears throat> right? Yeah, but one thing to mention is it's persistence, just going back here, it's persistence. The AR1 coefficient is 0.79, okay? Mm. Which, I mean, it's quite a bit less persistent than the dividend price ratio or the dividend yield, right? Or some of these other commonly used predictors. But this yeah. is a sign of predictors that work. I mean, is it is a potential explanation that um, you get better estimates of the equity risk premium at two years than you do at one month? I think at one month is just so much noise. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, related. it's exactly that. There's just yeah. so much and your persistence is contributing a little bit and um, then over time 
your predictor then begins to show significance. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and and then about the fact that like of the many tail differences, let's say, you know, five percent was not so predictive, but fifteen percent was. Um, that, you know, sounds related to the point Mike Lipkin made at the beginning of your talk that at the extreme tails, you have all the bit offer spread effects being very important. Yes, I mean, the 5% wouldn't be really considered that extreme, mind you. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, you know more than me, but I, I don't think they're that extreme. You could go further, but I just think, so that, that could be certainly an issue, right? But I also think it's just, uh, they're more volatile. Um, so the predictor is more volatile at 5% than it is at say 10% or 15%. Uh, so you get higher significance then at like these less extreme quantiles. And if you go into even then, if you kind of narrow the quantiles down much, much more, the significance drops away. Okay, which is kind of not surprising if we look back at this graph, these quantiles, these narrower quantiles are not that sensitive to this uh, stochastic jump, stochastic disaster risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so finally, then we do some simulations because um, just to uh, uh, compare the results that we got to simulate the results from the Watchtower model. So we draw a ten thousand samples of lambda, which is this latent stochastic uh, disaster risk intensity. So we draw 10,000 samples of that from the stationary distribution, we, uh, which is a gamma distribution, and we use the parameters from Watcher. And for each gamma, we numerically solve for the, for the quantiles and, and the quantile difference, or we call it tail difference. And then for each lambda as well, we can also calculate in closed form the equity risk premium. Now we actually calculate the instantaneous equity risk premium, which is then equivalent it's equivalent to the annualized risk premium because we're using annualized parameters. And um, we probably need to refine these simulations and look over different horizons, different return horizons. So um, then we estimate the normalized covariance between the ERP and the Watcher model and this tail difference that we extract from the Watcher model. So this is just purely a simulation using the parameters from that paper. And uh, again, this is the same stationary distribution that we draw the, lambda, the lambdas from. Um, these are the risk neutral tail differences in the watcher model. Again, they've been annualized. So this is only a 5%. And um, these are the results from the watcher model then. So we see, because obviously this is this very simplified setting, we see huge significance also, we have, uh, we have 10,000 realizations of lambda here. So here we see um, like the beta at 5%. So the ERP, if we were to regress the ERP on the tail difference from Watcher, we get a beta of 0.32 at 5% and it's highly significant. And what we see in the, even in the Watcher model that the beta is more significant at 10% than it is at 5%, even though at 5% the tail difference is much more sensitive to lambda. And if we look above here, we can see why this is the case because the standard deviation of the tail difference is much lower at 10% than it is at 5%. Um, and we also get a positive correlation, a very strong high correlation between the dividend price ratio and the tail difference, um, which is also what we find in the empirical data. Obviously, this is just from the model. So what we'd like to do in the simulations of this particular model are to um, vary the horizon of the holding period for the, for the equity risk premium and look at the effect there. But we see that the significance peaks at 10% in the watcher model and then starts coming down again. Okay, so we're getting 
some similar effects, but you may notice something that's quite different in the simulations of the washer model and in the empirical data. The mean tail difference in the washer model, this is 5.5% or so, whereas the empirical mean of the tail difference was something like 44%. If I just come back here, the empirical mean of the tail difference is 44%. So using the parameters in the washer model, it's uh, they're not nearly high enough to generate the tail differences we observe in the market. Yet those parameters we use in the washer model are giving us exactly uh, the right ballpark for the equity risk premium. So it turns out in, in, in this simulation of the washer model, the equity risk premium is 7.35%. And this is using reasonable risk aversion levels and reasonable leverage values. And the dividend, uh, the dividend price mean is approximately minus 400, which is more or less what we observe in reality. Uh, look, up here we have minus 400 for the mean. This is the annualized mean of um, the log dividend minus the log price. So those washer parameters are reproducing stylized empirical facts that we see in, on the stock market. And it's certainly giving us motivation for why that tail difference is a predictor of market returns, but we're not able to generate the high values of tail difference. Um, and finally here, in the last couple of tables, we just do some robustness tests. So this table is probably a bit too uh, detailed for, uh, for Zoom, but um, so these are univariate regressions, but we just we don't just do it for the tail difference. We look at other predictors as well. So it's quite different to the dividend price ratio, even though the dividend price ratio is highly it's it's highly correlated to the dividend price ratio. This tail difference we find it kicks in at, at, at two year horizons or more, whereas the dividend price ratio works the whole way across. On the other hand, if we look at the variance risk premium, that works at short horizons, but then once you get to one year or more, it, it doesn't work, okay? And it actually is stronger than the left jump, the, uh, the left risk neutral jump tail variation from Borislev, Todorov and Zoo. The, it's a stronger predictor of the marker risk premium, which is the second last one here. And then, um, Last, last, second last table, the next slide is just an extension of it and then I'll finish. I, I can imagine you all want to uh, go and get, uh, get some dinner. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> well. So this is where we do bivariate regressions. So we include the tail difference and another predictor, like a well-known predictor, such as like the VRP or the left risk neutral uh, jump tail variation or dividend price ratio and so on. So a couple of interesting points I just wanted to bring to your attention were if we look at realized variance, now there's a strong negative correlation between tail difference and realized variance. And if we look at realized variance, uh, the tail difference coefficient gets really large and the coefficient of the realized variance becomes minus 22, it gets really small are really negative, uh, but uh, that's interesting. They both become quite significant with a high or squared. Uh, if we look at short horizons with respect to VRP, uh, it's not significant. The VRP dominates at short horizons. But if we, if I'm skipping ahead here to longer horizons where it kicks in. If we look at long horizons, for instance, with respect uh, to the VRP, the tail difference coefficient here is 3.75 and it's significant, whereas the VRP then is no longer significant. This tends to hold. Furthermore, it kicks out the significance of the left risk neutral jump tail variation. So the tail difference, well, it's actually no longer significant there at two years, but at, if we go to three years or more, it's still significant and uh, the LJV variable becomes insignificant. So, it's so, so stepping back, I mean, um, your this table is about asking if you're going to couple um, tail difference with a second variable. 
what would be the best second variable to, to use in predicting equity risk premium? Is, is that the idea of this table? Yeah, and I suppose it's kind of a robustness check as well of the results that like it's robust to some of these other well-known predictors that the results still hold even when you include them. Yeah, so the, the column uh, called adjusted R squared, that's the adjusted R squared in a regression of equity risk premium on two independent is. variables, is that right? Yes. Okay. That's, that's, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so for instance, if we look at the two year horizon, if we look at um, this RV row here, what we're talking about here is the TD coefficient is 6.37 and the RV coefficient is minus 3.46. Okay. okay. This is the significance of the TD coefficient and this is the <clears> significance <throat> of the realized variance coefficient. This is the R squared. Okay. 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 Yeah. <clears throat> so that's really it then. So just to conclude then, model free quantile formula is proposed. We extract risk neutral return quantiles in the S&P 500. Complements existing model free methods and, and possibly could be used to construct the model free corridor vari variant subcontract. Uh, the consumption based asset pricing model of Washtra is used to motivate the empirical results. We find that it predicts the ERP at longer horizons. It's found to be, uh, it's found to be complementary uh, to the variance risk premium which is a significant predictor of short horizons. Uh, the empirical results are compared to simulation results from the Washington model and they match up reasonably well. Um, in that in the Washington model, we also find that tail differences in the Washington model that are extracted from the risk neutral density, they also would predict the equity risk premium in the simple model. Uh, there is some disagreement also in that the Washington model doesn't generate large enough tail differences like we see in the market and that's it so thanks a million for coming along and listening to my presentation well thank you uh, um i don't know if the audience knows that it's uh it's almost midnight where you are <laughs> so we really it's, appreciate you it's uh, five minutes of midnight. Yeah, yeah 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 so live um, from live from dublin yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um but We'll let you go at midnight, but um, yeah, I just have a, a comment. So, um, which is that um, I guess in um, there's a, a related statistic to tail difference that people know about in especially in derivatives markets, and it's called the risk reversal. So, just a reminder that it's the risk reversal is the difference between a, a put implied vol in the call implied vol um, when the put implied vol is for say i'll use five delta <laughs> okay um which which means you know so very deep out of the money but and um yeah. and the call implied vol is is also you know like you would call it 0.95 i guess but you know yeah, it's yeah. the um yeah it's also you know equally deep out of the money in probability sure. terms which is delta okay they're using delta so it's yeah. similar, right? In the sense, it's similar mm -hmm. tail difference while not being identical. Um, and, um, you know, so anyway, um, it's just a thought that, you know, maybe it's a variation on tail difference. You look at risk reversal, this difference sure. in light balls. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, nice one to, is nice one to try. Okay. Um, and, you know, then, then there's also a contract as opposed to a quote <laughs> called risk reversal. So the contract is when you're, you would, let's say, buy, it's a, you know, equity people call it a collar. So you buy a deep out of money put and you sell a deep out of money call. Okay. And then, and, you know, and then general is premium. Although it could be a zero cost collar. That's one version. The standard thing is a zero cost collar. So, so anyway. And so really, I mean, I think what you're doing is sort of the, you're actually doing the zero cost binary caller, <laughs> okay? Because you have like binary puts and binary calls throughout the money. Okay. Yeah, okay. And um, so, um, and you know, you're finding the difference between the pair of strikes for binary options that 
um, leads to zero cost. So anyway, so there's all these, let's say, slight variations you could try, I'm just saying. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know. Sure, that's, that's the risk control. Definitely be well known to people who, especially in FX, let's say. Yeah. You quote that all the time. And probably a lot easier to extract, I guess. No. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's actually quoted. <laughs> like, it wouldn't, I mean, if you did on F, it's not quoted in equities, which is what you're looking at. But if you're, if you're actually were using currencies, it's directly quoted. There's no, there's no extraction effort. It's just the number that you see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and would it be associated with having forecasting power of the underlying or? Yeah, actually, Lurin and I have a paper about the forecasting power of risk reversals for um yeah for for subsequent you know returns on on exchange rates and um there's strong okay so so the strong short term um you know covariation but that doesn't help you because it's contemporaneous it's actually contemporaneous so so you know it's not forecasting okay. i might have said okay. but the mistake was forecasting sorry it's it's only oh, contemporaneous so Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, that's the, that's interesting. Yeah. So um. Look, yeah. So I, it, but it seems like you found something very interesting. A complement to the variance risk premium in forecasting equity returns, pre equity um, risk premium, so excess returns over risk free rate, um, for longer horizons like two years, and um, so um, so that sounds very valuable. And um, you know, I'm just suggesting some fine tuning. Sure, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely have a look in, at those. Okay. Anybody else want to uh, chime in, or are we going to let uh, Colonel go to sleep? <laughs> no. <laughs> David, did you want to say something? Because uh, you're muted, David. Oh, okay. I thought I had my microphone off. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, is it possible that we could find this effect by using just the skew of the um, implied vol curve? Would it be that robust or would it, do you think it would disappear in that? So we used a model free skew, so it's probably um, slightly different to the skew you're talking about. But model free skew. Didn't... Yeah, that risk reversal I mentioned earlier is a measure of slope of implied vol. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, just, you know, just in terms of ex explaining this to, uh, you know, um, traders, if you will, that might not be as, you know, mathematically advanced, is this something you could say that the the skew would predict these, these sort of uh, longer term premium? Uh, I guess so, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, 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 if this tail difference is high, the skew is going to be high, right? Um, I mean, I suppose what we have maybe is slightly finer tuned in that like we can tune the probability level and we can see there's like a hump shape in the in yeah, be interesting to compare. I mean, I think, you know, I would, you know, let's say, because I agree with David, that, that's sort of like the first thing derivatives people think about when they're trying to capture what you're trying to capture. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so, um, so you're proposing an alternative and, you know, at least you want to convince them to move away from what they already are familiar with. <laughs> you really should show yeah. it has better predictive power, which it very well might. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay, well, let's wrap up. So just a reminder that um, this talk has been recorded, that we'll be uploading the video in about a week uh, to YouTube. So in case you missed anything, you can catch it then. I'd like to thank Colonel for staying up late and um, thank, thank you all you. for attending. Nice so it's nice seven o'clock here and um it's uh tomorrow over there <laughs> so uh let's uh <laughs> let's wrap up <laughs> okay all right all bye. right bye. 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 cheers bye cheers <laughs>